Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I guess uh, people in the Slack are following. There was a comment. Could someone please link to the stream in chat? So maybe uh, if you can provide the link to that guy. So today is the second lecture, and uh, in the first lecture we talked about some uh, good practices and in particular some rules that are um, useful to make your URIs and your interactions uh, more meaningful and of more high quality. And uh, when we are talking about quality, it always refers to um, how easily your clients can access or use your APIs and not only for that but also how uh, how useful uh, they are uh, for the future maintenance and, and evolution because APIs continuously evolve and uh, you need to upgrade your APIs or uh, provide new uh, resources so bad design or poor design is always an issue uh, when you are uh, talking about maintenance and that's why the first thing I wanted to introduce is uh, the identifier design and the other interaction design related concepts. So today we will talk more about uh, design. And uh, as you know, in, in REST, uh, the four main uh, obvious uh, players are the resources or their identifier, the interaction between resources, uh, the metadata about the, uh, of, the, of the resources and the representation of the resources. So that's why I have this four design book, I would say, uh, about identifier, interaction, metadata, and representation. But I will conclude with some of the client concerns or some, uh, some, more, uh, uh, some more insights on, onto the design practices or good design practices. So metadata design, so what is metadata? Uh, if we think about uh, the HTTP res responses and uh, request, it always has two part by default, uh, depending of course on the HTTP method. So the the headers and the body. The body is always about uh, the content of the resource or the information that we are looking for. But then there is also this metadata that gives you some meta information about the body. And in that context, we have basically three types of metadata or three categories of metadata in, in the request header and in the response header. And some of them are about resources. Some of them are about the representation or how they are represented uh, in the body and also uh, in the server. And some of them are also about caching because uh, these three are also integral part of, uh, of res REST resources. So coming back to the rules again, so I guess today we will have around 23 rules and in the first class we had around 27 rules. So these 50 rules with made up a good story I think for your assignment also to start with and to, imp to implement them. The first one is a uh, content type must be used uh, by the by the server or by, by or, or the by the response uh, headers in particular when you are providing a resource to the client you should say what's in the rec uh, in the response body what's format you have or what data type you have or what content type you had and this is the very common structure for providing the content type so content type uh, equals to type slash subtype. So there are many different types. Uh, obviously, you know some of them. Application, uh, audio, video, text, image, and there are uh, other al are also vendor specific types. And usually, uh, if it's a binary data or machine processable data, we use always application 
but there is also different types of subtypes of application but else multimedia data for uh, we use audio video and uh, images so this is the false rule always have this content type in your response header then the second rule also always have your uh, length or the size of your uh, your response in uh, in your response header so the content length and the benefit of having this is that if you specify exact number of bytes in your uh, in your response in as a value of this response length the client will uh, know that he did not miss even a single byte of the of the data or, or, or of the resource representation and this also we can know using the head request so that's why head request is so useful uh, to get the metadata about the resources and the presentation of this uh, content length uh, parameter or header uh, header member is a uh, content length equals to content length it can be in byte or it can be in other form of ways like kilobyte or megabyte depending on what you want then there is also this last modified uh, uh, field or parameter that you should also in, uh, include in the response header it usually is the time stamps but uh, it's always or it's, it's a very good practice for your uh, guest math get methods or any other safe methods that do not uh, change your uh, uh, resources to include that last modified uh, field in your uh, response header so in that way client can know uh, the interval or wh when was the resource was last accessed so this is also a very simple rule about uh, designing metadata then about e tag so e tag is also another very uh, common but uh, newer than other uh, other parameters so you basically provide a, a a fingerprint or a code based on which you know that uh, if the resources or the representations has been changed or not and similar to uh, the previous rule like last modified uh, it's also good for guest request so this e tag should be also always included for the guest request uh, get request because uh, it's also help uh, the clients as a uh, as a resource consumer the format is also simple simple e tag and then uh, colon or uh, space the e tag value this e tag is also used uh, by the servers when a uh, client is providing or adding uh, this if none match or if match request header so if client is providing uh, a bunch of uh, in the field of e none match if none match then what the server does is it checks all the e tags and only if none of them matches then he provides the resource requested by the client so in that way he is not providing duplicate values that clients already have because client include only those e tag that he has uh, the resources with him and similarly if match client might uh, tell that i need uh, a resource for this e tag which I don't have now so he can mention that if match with this e-tag or some e-tag provide me the request so uh, server can read uh, in the same way and provide the resource if he find an exact match of the provided e-tag and this is a good technique also uh, to uh, to verify if between server and client uh, at and some and some network uh, like it can be a content delivery network it can be any other caching uh, facility that if the resources w resources were modified or uh, someone tried to modify it or not so media collision the location uh, this is also a very simple yet a powerful rule once you created a resource or once you uh, modified a resource you should always provide this uh, this value in your uh, in your response uh, header or response metadata so this provides basically the new location of the newly created or modified uri uh, the, for, uh, the format is also simple 
like location and then uh, URL. That is the new location of the uh, of the newly created URLs uh, resources. The sixth rule says uh, case control expire and date uh, response header should be uh, encouraged. And there are some differences between HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 1.0. In HTTP 1.1, you simply says that uh, cache control max age equals to let's say 60 seconds. So after 60 seconds, that data or that resource or that state of the resource will not be valid anymore. Uh, you must revalidate if the state of the after 60 seconds if the state of the uh, resource has been changed or not. But uh, this is for uh, HTTP 1.1, but for HTTP 1.0, you explicitly mention when the resource is, was created and when it will expire. So there is no simple way to tell the clients that uh, how or what is the condition of, this, uh, of the caching. And caching can be done uh, in, in any places between uh, in, the, in the client network or in the server network or even the uh, content delivery or explicit caching uh, servers. Uh, the request, uh, so sorry, the rule six said uh, this cache control exp expires and uh, the date, sh they should be mentioned or they should be encouraged. But rule seven, it's kind of um, opposite. So if you don't want caching, you should also mention, but in this case, uh, instead of saying the age, you should simply say uh, no cache or no store. And this is for HTTP 1.1, but for HTTP 1.0, you have to say uh, no cache and then there is no expired date. So it's basically zero, you should have to, you have to mention. But in general, even though you can choose to uh, do the caching or not. Uh, the rule eight says, in general, it should be always uh, preferable. You should always prefer uh, having having a cache because um, if you prevent the cache, that means you are uh, going against the rest constraint or rest principles, and that is uh, not a good design choice. So in that case, if you even don't want to do the caching, uh, depending on like if the data is sensitive or not, you can. Uh, if you don't want to do the caching, maybe you can choose a very small uh, age for that uh, data, let's say one second or two seconds. So in that way, your design will be also uniform uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the resources. The expiration, so even if you get a data uh, using a get method or any other method, let's say the method that's, uh, that's not changing your states or let's say head method. So even if you get the data and you received like 200 uh, this uh, status, then you should also put in your response header this expiration. So this expiration is kind of a safeguard or safety check so that the client uh, unintentionally not using the expired data anymore or unintentionally using the wrong data. So if you put even with a get method this expiration or expired date for a data at some like after that expiration date cl client automatically can get the new data and uh, revalidate his uh, resource state. So this is also a good practice um, to have expire even with the uh, uh, get method or head method. Uh, uh, the rule 10 says a uh, custom HTTP headers must not be used. So as a developer, we always try to come up with uh, new ideas, uh, new headers, in particular custom headers that are not really REST specific and they are not part of the REST standard. They are business specific. They are sometimes even developer specific. So what they do, they without any reason or without good reasons, they add some more complexity. And, and that also not only good for uh, the clients, develop client developers itself, but also uh, who are uh, using your um, APIs or who are, uh, who are, who are, who are, who are
trying to maintain your APIs. So extra headers or non-standard headers, in other words, are not encouraged in REST. And you can do what you can do if you want really want uh, some some custom headers or non-standard headers. And if you think that those are for informational purpose, you put in in the body, and uh, then uh, it ups up to the client if he or the users if he want to parse the body and uh, use the body to get some more information about the headers. And in some cases, uh, it might also fail. Like uh, if you are providing a non-standard header for certain methods that are not required or that they are not expecting th to process those uh, headers, they might even fail. So it's always safe to use not to use non-standard headers or uh, custom headers. And in fact, uh, I can show you a result, a, a, a practical analysis to uh, how many people are really using these non-standard or uh, custom headers where developers are suffering much. you will be uh, surprised. There are uh, some examples, so I was thinking which one I should show you. So if you look at this article, it uh, it analyzed. So there is a poor design. They call it breaking self descriptiveness basically what they are saying that you are using too much custom uh, http headers or non standard http headers that are not really useful for your apis so what we what what they found if you look at this figure uh, there are some uh, big guys like facebook twitter youtube and also others like uh, I don't know if you uh, yeah Dropbox. So as you can see, they all have this uh, BSD. So this is breaking self descriptiveness. So they ha all have non-standard headers. Facebook also have like bunch of non-standard headers. So 29. So we uh, they analyzed 29 mm, URIs from our request uh, HTTP request. And they found that all of them has uh, non-standard headers. Similarly, Twitter has 10 out of 10, they had non-standard headers. YouTube has the same. And then Dropbox has a little bit less, but as, uh, this is evident in practice that developers are using a lots of uh, non-standard headers. And this is uh, not good for r uh, REST design. So media types, and before we were talking about was talking about the metadata, but now we will talk about media type and uh, media type design practices. So if you know about this uh, authority, uh, in Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, so they are uh, the, the authority for defining media types, uh, assigning uh, IP numbers, uh, assigning domain names, and so on. So they are one of the 
uh, big stakeholders in in the web in the in the web world so they have defined this standard sets of uh, media type uh, basically they are also similar to content type and uh, uh, application audio font exam example and so on and but there can be also vendor specific media types uh, so if facebook wants to use let's say uh, so there is a, a new media type in facebook like 360 uh, degree images in facebook do you use it so they might have their own media types and, uh, and the different vendors and they may have their own defined media types and then what they need to do is they need to get approval from this organization uh, they cannot simply define and use it so there are different rules uh, for designing uh, media type and the first of the first rule it says that application media type should be used application is specific so for example uh, i am uh, getting a resource using the get method about a player with this id in a json but it I, if i get a response uh, i will get of course by default a json a json format but this, this json format only uh, when when i use the content type will only tell the content of the response that that i'm receiving but this uh, content type does not tell uh, how the Ob player object or uh, what is the schema of the player object itself or uh, it doesn't tell anything about the player representation so to uh, avoid that or to uh, complement that i would say basically you, sh you, sh you should not only have a content type that is application slash let's say uh, json but on top of that you can have other compound uh, resource representation let's say uh, application slash wrml uh, wrml so this is a new kind of uh, representation for resources and it is known as web resource modeling language uh, do you know this language no so this is a very new initiative and they are also open source and they are open standards so anyone can use them uh, it's, it's, it's also very uh, user friendly language to model your resources and they have I think also a tool that you can use so if you use for example this kind of uh, uh, resource representation it will tell you that the the format or the uh, or representation of the resource is in JSON and then on top of it it will provide a schema which will tell you uh, what objects or sorry what properties or criteria this uh, player object has so if you can if you want to use uh, XML, you want to use this schema. If you want to choose uh, JSON, JSON doesn't have any schema, but still you can uh, map to this schema uh, whatever data you receive as a part of your uh, GET request. So the book that introduced uh, all these rules, they also introduced uh, this tool and this modeling language but for the sake of this content or for the sake of this course I did not include uh, anything about WRML so web resource modeling language this is a new language and that maybe you should also uh, have a look and this is also very useful for modeling your resources then the rule 12 it says that the client should always negotiate the the resource representation so if you cannot uh, bind your client to a single representation so a client should have a freedom which uh, media type they want which uh, representation they want for the resources and that's uh, that's why this rule is important also uh, uh, in, in in the context of rest it says media type nego negotiation should be supported when multiple representations are available so not only as a server you should provide multiple representations but you should also give the client uh, to uh, to choose which uh, representation they want and for this one there is a specific keyword called accept so this is uh, different from the content type and so if you mention that accept and then the uh, content type not the content type media type 
then client can have uh, that representation in the desired format. So uh, the difference between accept and content type is that accept uh, accept uh, identifies which representations he wants for the resource or the target target resource, but the content says that what is the represent representation of the current uh, response from the server and that is that is present in the body. So that body might have some more resources and more links to more resources and for those resources you the client will basically tell that I want uh, this format uh, using this accept keyword. Then uh, rule number 13 media type selection using a query parameter should be supported so this is kind of uh, I think in the previous lecture we had this kind of structures where uh, in the URI you have a query part and in the query you can not only filter the data you can not only specify uh, what you want but you can also uh, specify uh, what form you want as a part of the resource representation so instead of using this accept header you can simply you can simply say that uh, with this get method uh, for this resource i just uh, want this resource to be represented in xml so for with this one your uh, response body could be in different format but if the details of this mikemason.com is in your response body you will uh, be get also this response body in xml but if if get if you get a new link to this resource then uh, that new link will be obviously in this xml format but your response current response could be in a json for example and this is also uh, related to the other rules like when you are accepting uh, or you are specifying which uh, media type you want using this accept keyword you can do that but you cannot do like dot xml dot json dot text or so, or so on in the text in the uri path so this is something else uh, than uh, uh, specifying the file types uh, or file extensions in the uri so that was uh, something about metadata. So uh, the resource representation and metadata uh, uh, design. And now we come, yeah, come back to uh, resource representation uh, or resource uh, representation design, basically. So re uh, representation divide. Uh, basically, representation is the body part of the entity. Before we ha were discussing uh, header part of the entity and uh, it specific, uh, strictly or explicitly defines or represents the body or what the body looks like so that's the representation it can be uh, plain text it can be uh, xml or json or anything and rule 14 says by default uh, you always have to choose json or at least it should uh, your api should support json you can use other formats uh, but that will be on top of json and that will also increase the usability uh, of your uh, api so what the bottom line is whatever you choose whatever media type you choose you should always choose the json one first and then the other ones and while you are choosing the json this is also a very basic rule on JSON forma formation. Uh, rule 15 says your JSON must be well formed. Uh, by well formed, it means it should be consistent across all ac all across your application. So for one resource, you might use a double quotation for your string, for example, but for other resource you did not. So that's not a consistent design. And this is also important for uh, if you want your application to be uh, platform independent and uh, if you want uh, your application uh, have no problem uh, regardless of the operating system or, or the host environment that's why having a consistent design is always important and uh, since JSON doesn't have any schema uh, a, you have to make, make sure that you have a well structured uh, name value pair so there should not be any 
uh, missing brackets or missing comma or whatsoever. Uh, this is a simple example of how JSON looks like or how it should look like. So always use double quotation. Uh, always use uh, this uh, consistent design like in one line you have uh, key value then comma in the following line. So try to follow this simple uh, design or simple uh, representation of documents. You, you could represent it in uh, two lines instead of five lines, it would not make any, any, any sense, any difference, but if you uh, organize it uh, for your, for your sim simple design and uh, simple understandability, it, uh, it helps the client a lot. Then uh, XML and other formats may optionally be used. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, JSON should be always the first preference, but XML should be uh, also considered because there are also uh, significant number of applications that are still still using XML. So not everybody have migrated to REST uh, perfectly. And for example, Amazon also use uh, XML in their backend, but they also use JSON. So XML should be also considered uh, for your APIs uh, for the client to accept. And then there is hypermedia uh, representation design. So hypermedia, as we discussed until now, is one of the most basic, or I would say most important aspect for REST. And uh, through the hypermedia, basically you are uh, moving across your application or moving across the state of your resources. And that's why uh, it's always important to have uh, links in your resources. Uh, for example, even if you are not creating any uh, new resource, it's always, to, always good, uh, or if you don't have any new resource in your response, it's always good to provide your self-link. So this is another good practice that uh, client developers should uh, follow. And providing links in the resources also not only help uh, the clients, but I mean, it can help them so that they can programmatically parse the response and uh, provide, uh, follow the links and uh, navigate through the application. So one of the basic rule for uh, re uh, hypermedia design, so you should always have a consistent uh, form. So what consistent form, uh, what by consistent form, what I meant is, for example, in, in one of your resource, you designed with HRF uh, relation link, request types, response types, and title. And in another resor resources or other resources, you chose only the first two because those first two are mandatory and the remaining three are optional. So you cannot do that. Uh, what you should do, your um, representation should be always consistent. So if you have five resources, try to have the same structure for the five for the five resources. For example, for the get method or for the uh, other other methods. Uh, in this case, uh, request types. Basically, what are the uh, what are the request methods that you that, that you can apply on this uh, resource on the HRF link? Then the response time uh, response types. What are the response uh, format that you might that you might have. Uh, uh, from this link, and then the title is uh, any textual description. So this is a simple example, and by default, as I mentioned, uh, these are the two uh, default uh, links or uh, um, members that you always have in your uh, resource representation or hypermedia representation, where uh, this HRF, this provides the target resource or the actual resource that we are interested in. And then we have real link that describe or that provides, provides the content of this, uh, context of this HRF link. Uh, rule 18, a consistent form should be used to advertise your link. So in the previous uh, rule, rule 17, it says a consistent form 
for the links, so for, uh, for your resource representation in terms of links. But this one is also a consistent, uh, about consistency, but this time it's about if you are adding further links in your, uh, in your response. So for that one, what you are doing, basically, you have this uh, links keyword. And as I mentioned also, by default, always have this uh, self link. So that denotes or refers to the current resource. But also, if you want to uh, add links to other resources, always have the same format. So href rel, href rel, href rel. But you, if you want to add other information, what this rule said also add those other information for all the case all the cases and that's why uh, this consistent form is also uh, useful and important for designing hypermedia representation then the self link uh, i think i also mentioned it already like this is a, a good practice and that's why they made it as a rule like always include the uh, self link in the resource representation and if you <coughs> this, uh, include this link in your resource representation, even, even if you don't need, it's, it's a kind of uh, reference or uh, uh, if some reasons clients want to get the link back, it's uh, also a good point or good representation having this uh, self-link in your representation. So this is a by default a good practice. Uh, having this self link in your resource representation. And uh, is there any question in Slack? No. So maybe what we can do, I think we finished 50% slides. So we, we co continue and then we might uh, finish earlier. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, okay. So now I will go. So uh, I would. I wanted to show uh, show some uh, rules regarding so basic rules, some uh, regarding metadata design and representation design. But what I will do, I will show some practical uh, concerns uh, by the, by the clients, and some uh, then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. And one of the or some of the uh, client concerns regarding uh, on REST APIs are regarding the versioning, the security, the response representation composition. So basically, you have the freedom to, uh, to uh, select some part of your resource representations instead of taking the whole representation. And then also the processing hypermedia. So how you want to hyper process your hypermedia or the links, and if you want to have any JavaScript clients. Uh, I think I did not include in the, in the discussion this JavaScript client, but there are many JavaScript clients that you can uh, get uh, for your uh, for your APIs, or you can also develop your own. So the first thing is versioning. A REST API is composed of interlinked resources known as resource model. So this resource model is also a known concept or popular concept uh, as we mentioned like this kind of designing your database or uh, designing your your object model so with your resources you you design your resource model and uh, it might or might not be important to know the version of the resources and uh, there is a, a good debate or I would say confusion maybe, if we should include the version in the URI or if you should consider the version as a part of the URI. So what do you think? Uh, do, 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 we sh do developers should include the version in uh, as a part of the URI? But uh, are you always running your several versions at the same time? Uh, perhaps if you are migrating to a new version. Yeah. Yeah, there is a, uh, this confusion. Uh, the confusion is mainly because, I, I will say why. 
in general, it's a good practice to have versions. Uh, in particular, the major versions, you might omit the minors were minor versions because uh, even change, uh, a small change, a character change in URI is a minor, minor version or minor uh, improvement or minor changes. But the main reason uh, why some people don't like version is that, for take look at the example, in the first example. So this is the uh, scheme, this is the, uh, the owner, and this is the type of the API. So it could be API or developer or whatever. So some people also prefer api.restful.com or some people uh, prefer uh, slash API. And then you have the version followed by the whole bunch of resources. So the confusion is if this version is about, the, uh, about this part of the endpoint or if it's about any of the resources or immediate resources. So that's the main confusion part. So th thus this version is about the URI, sorry, the, the main endpoint, or this version is about one of the resources or all the resources. So we might, uh, from this URI, we might think that uh, this is the version two of this Monolisa resource, but this is not the case. That's why some people prefer uh, not including any, any version in the URI. But uh, I personally would say that uh, a version should be included in the URI, but only the major version, not the minor version. Because if you also include minor version, let's say version 2.1, and dot, of course, has a different meaning for URIs, like all these dots. So it will create uh, a mess uh, in your URI design. And uh, that's why I, I, I mentioned here, the version of the REST APIs or resources should not be signified in an URI. It's because uh, in the book itself, uh, they were uh, debating. And also, I looked at Microsoft uh, REST APIs standard guideline, and they said you should include the versioning. So there is like contradicting uh, feedback or comments from the practitioners. But uh, it's a good practice to, in, uh, to include the versioning in the URI. And even if you are creating a new resource or introducing new resource in the middle of your, uh, uh, while your system is running, uh, it might not be the good idea to introduce or add new versions because if you are if if you are creating a new version f just for one resource, uh, it's not that uh, obvious that you need to take the whole system down and then deploy them again, or introduce a new version of for the whole system. So there is this mixed uh, comments or mixed. Uh, feedback from the practitioners. And that's one other, another important client concern regarding the versioning. But what way of doing this versioning is, uh, in, in, in particular for specific resources or single resources, is uh, you can have this e-tag. Of course, e-tag has other mm, uses for the clients, but you can also use this e-tag to say a particular, uh, say a particular change in a particular resource. Uh, and or for example, a particular representation for a particular resource. And this using this e-tag is one clever way of handling this versioning uh, issues or versioning problem. And uh, using this e-tag, you cannot you can even represent very simple changes like very fine grained uh, character level changes in the URIs, for example. And then obviously they are not. Uh, representing the same resource anymore. So then it's about security. And uh, one of the main security concern for the clients is uh, how you represent your, uh, sorry, uh, make your data secure uh, or your application secure, your resources secure. And to do that, uh, 
OAuth. So did you use OAuth or developed OAuth before? So maybe then you know better than me because I did not develop also myself, but I, I, I just read it. So this is very common and popular and I think one of the widely used now for the authori uh, authorization or authentication for both. And uh, through this auth authentication mechanism, you share your resources, uh, sensitive resources, to uh, authorized uh, applications or, or third-party applications. So basically, uh, all the big players, including Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Google, Twitter, and what else, Yahoo, they all rely on OAuth and other small companies or other small applications, they use them at the, as the authorization server and you can authorize, for example, for your uh, one of your application through your Facebook account or through, through your Google account and in the back end it, it is done through uh, OAuth or op open authorization. So there is a very simple uh, explanation of uh, OAuth protocol. So maybe you, you know it. And uh, so this client is basically the third party, uh, third party application or any other application. And so I am the resource owner. Uh, this is the Facebook, Google, or uh, uh, Microsoft, or Yahoo. And then this is the server where my documents or resources are actually located. So what they do, or this th third party client do, they ask my permission. Sometimes you receive a uh, permission link from Facebook or Google that if you want to allow or if you uh, don't want to allow. So once you allow them, and they get a key, uh, application key or any other key that they use uh, for authenticating uh, for to authenticate themselves on behalf of the client or on sorry on behalf of myself to the Google server or Microsoft server that I have this authorization from the owner so grant me uh, to access their resources so with if it's authenticated then the authorization server gives a access token using which it will again talk to the actual um, server that has the resources and the server get give the access so one of the benefit of having this OAuth protocol is that it perfectly is aligned with the rest statefulness, sorry, statelessness and uh, client con so client server concern uh, and all other uh, six, uh, all those six constraints. So in particular, the statelessness uh, uh, and also the caching. So all these six constraints are, are, are reflected through this uh, OAuth protocol. Over protocol, so that's the reason it's uh, perfectly good for REST applications also. And then another client concern is uh, response representation composition. Uh, in general, what we know that we have to design our resources, and uh, as a service provider or as a server developer, and then the client APIs, what they do, they directly or only take that resource, but this is a very old concept. So there are new ideas, like I re design my resources in a way that the client APIs or client developers can take my resource and use only sub part of it, not all of it. And this is known as uh, resource representation composition, where using the query, uh, for example, a client, API, uh, client developer I have a uh, I have a resource called person. So this Morgan is a person or a student, and I want to get only the first name and the date of birth from his whole document. So client developers can uh, filter the resource in this way using this field keyword. So this is also a new concept where you can filter your resource that was not meant to fil to be filtered. And once uh, in the response, it get, uh, of course, the the content type, the the schema of the student, 
uh, what format that doc document or response will be or resource will be represented and what are the fields I want uh, for this particular uh, request and also as a part of this request out of the whole document I get only these two information from the resource. So this is uh, another uh, useful use uh, useful uh, feature for the client developers of using this uh, field command or field uh, in the in the URI request URI. And then there is not only uh, you can filter what you want on particular things you want, but you can also filter what things you don't want. So that's the other way. So if you simply use a not word uh, not symbol symbol before all your parameters and using the same field keywords uh, from this Morgan document it can exclude all those uh, uh, information and gives you the new resource so although this Morgan resource have present in the both case but using this field command and using this not button we are getting different representations of the resources so that's another useful trick for the clients that uh, using the same resource they can play with uh, what they want and what, what they don't want and finally the uh, hypermedia processing uh, so in terms of from the client perspective once he has this representation or or responses uh, the only goal is for, uh, for the client is to get this resource right so this is the target resource the HRF so to, uh, so to get that what clients do uh, so if it's in JSON first of all this is the response body so he, he, he needs to parse this body uh, get the or isolate the uniform links so these are the uniform links uh, HRF so he needs to get all the HRFs isolate the link with with particular relation name and then uh, each link also has a relation name so this relation name describes uh, the HRF uh, resources or the resource that is in that HRF if you already pre previously had this link relation uh, downloaded you don't need to get the schema or the link relation again so you can avoid some duplications if you already have the downloaded and uh, recreation document you just uh, visit the link or use a get method or other any other method that can be applicable on this link to get that link uh, that resource but if you did not download already basically what you do you parse the document uh, you get the document you parse this relation document in that document you have the method what method this will be applicable for HRF resources and then using that method you simply make a call and finally uh, uh, you get the target resource. So this is uh, a kind of activity diagram for uh, processing hypermedia or how the links in uh, uh, links in resources uh, uh, the res response body should be processed. And some final uh, notes so I was mentioning this uh, REST Microsoft REST API guidelines it's a very good guidelines and I think if not all s some of my rules are also mentioned in these guidelines so my rules are from the from the books that I mentioned in the first lecture but this guideline is also very uh, clear and some good examples it has so maybe if you are interested you can look at these uh, guidelines uh, by Microsoft so this is their official guideline and they regularly update it but some of the th aspect from that guideline I will I will mention here and what they mentioned also in terms of uh, good design so the URL, URL uh, structure or URI structure uh, should always be easy to understand and read by the humans because humans are the first consumer of the, uh, of the URLs or URIs of course machines are uh, 
uh, traversing them or uh, locating them but humans are the primary customer for the URLs or URIs so it should be always easy to read and uh, understand so one good example is, is shown here like we are looking at the in uh, or fetching up an inbox or an email box of this guy uh, Jedo so we can simply design the URI like this is the URI version and then people then the uh, email ID that is unique slash inbox so if we get the inbox in this way we can get all the messages from the uh, from for this e uh, email but we can do the same thing in a bad way also so we get the users uh, jdo and then slash folders so in this way we get uh, all the folders from him from his email and we particularly select only the index uh, inbox folder using using this uh, uh, some form of uh, key or some some form of uh, encoded value and this is not really a good design uh, for the users or for the humans because for the inbox the address of the inbox will not change it will remain if it's remain in the same machine in the same uh, server but designing uh, URIs in this way it's much better or more easy to understand as an uh, API developer if I want to get access to the inbox of jo uh, Jedo and then the URL length uh, in practice there is there is no fixed URL length uh, you can have as much long as uh, URL you want but the recommended uh, length is basically two, uh, 2000 characters by practitioners and there is two, two reasons and first of all uh, most of the search engines uh, they rely or they like uh, uh, URL less than 2048 characters because if it's more longer it's uh, harder for them to uh, rank them and to find and to compare them and so on also Internet Explorer, for example, the maximum length is uh, less than 2,083 characters. So some browsers might not be able to uh, open your resource uh, if your resource length is or the URI length is uh, uh, too long. So this that's another uh, constraint that we have to remember in terms of URI length, and then the rest uh, resource creation with post and that's another uh, good practice uh, like when you are creating the resource uh, you are not only giving this http uh, status code and saying that the resource has been created but you must always put this new location of the new resource i think uh, we also mentioned it in the yeah in rule 5 we said that uh, this location header must be there uh, for the new resources and Microsoft guideline also mentions uh, or emphasize on this and then we should always have standard request and response headers that's also that was also mentioned in the Microsoft guide guideline that uh, we are not only concerned about uh, consistent design of uh, research uh, re sorry response body design or representation body design uh, while we are uh, giving the links but we also have this consistent design for rest uh, request and response headers so for all the resources uh, of course it, it can it can differ bit on the based on the uh, method or uh, resource you are applying on but uh, for example it doesn't have the response does not have here the location so when we are having a, a post method obviously we should have a, a resp uh, location he uh, header here so in general if it's a safe method you should always have this uh, common or consistent headers uh, for both request and response and i think uh, you already know some of or all of the members here so 
this is the compression if you want to have comp compressed uh, body what language you want to uh, your rest your rep representation is then the content type is also what is the rep uh, re representation type for your resource for this current resource not the target resource then uh, prefer minimal or uh, representation so if the if the preference is minimal there is no body else uh, there will be a full body and, and then for the e tag you have this if match if not non match things uh, for providing the e tag to the server and then also these are the common response header so server is providing the e tag uh, then preference applied it de depends on uh, on this field so if customer wants no uh, or minimal uh, body then the body is empty else uh, it can have a full body and so on so response format uh, i think we also discussed it uh, in the rep representation design so we always choose the json representation and json in the doc json document uh, the name uh, of the property should be always camel case so uh, you should not use uh, either a small case or all uh, capital case but by default you should always choose the small case if you have uh, multiple or longer names in the in, in your in your key value pairs and then i think uh, that was enough for us for the assignment purpose and also for the uh, also for learning how to design well your uh, your apis but not how to design your apis because you already know or you will know how to design apis but it's more important to know how to design well your apis so today we looked at metadata design mainly uh, rules uh, from 1 to 10 and it's about uh, content type content length and caching because that's what uh, the metadata pro uh, discuss and provide then we also discussed about media type design so in the metadata we might have uh, multiple media types or mul there are possible to have multiple media types so how we should uh, mention them or how uh, clients should uh, negotiate those me uh, media types uh, based on uh, accept uh, headers or maybe using some uh, parameter in the URI like uh, after the question mark you can use accept equals to application.xml and so on then we also showed some rules on uh, representation design so it's all about JSON and it should be always well formed and uh, consistently written like in the same structure and then also hypermedia design and rest is all about hypermedia right so uh, the links uh, and the relation links should be also consistently represented and when you are representing multiple resources in your response body they should be also uh, be presented in a consistent way so that's another aspect and finally the hypermedia representation design and uh, since uh, hypermedia is is the core part of, of the resource and uh, uh, there are also some client concern or versioning or security or even hypermedia processing so we should also remember when we are designing those rest apis about if we should include the, include the versioning or not or should we include the e tag to handle our versioning or resource versioning and should we also implement oauth and this is the one of the very popular uh, security security mechanism nowadays so if you don't know the oauth i would suggest there are plenty of tutorials how to implement OAuth? I guess also in your as a part of your assignment, uh, the security concern is a 
checkpoint for your assignment and there is also hypermedia processing so how you will process your uh, response uh, the, the links in the response body or the hypermedia that were provided so I think so far we uh, discussed 50 rules so 23 in this lecture and 27 in the first lecture and then uh, the goal of uh, so did you look at the uh, assignment yet so basically uh, for this part the goal of the assignment will be out of those 50 rules how many or to what extent you can implement in your in your assignment or in your project so i think uh, joan will uh, joan later will al also give you some more uh, introduction or information on the assignment later but everything we discussed in this five uh, sorry in this 50 rules are basically goal of your uh, assignment so let's say your api should at least support representations with applic so it should at least support the json if you had support for others it's also a bonus then it should follow the constraint of restful apis so basically you should have caching you should have uh, statelessness you should have that client server uh, structure you should have i don't remember all of them now but all those uh, five at least five uh, constraint except the last one so you should also have this uh, show this hatheros principle so basically the hypermedia you should uh, show that your resources have links in your uh, in your in your design and uh, clients can follow that those links so the assignment asks you to give at least read, create, update, and delete resources. So that's for uh, these four basic methods. Uh, it maybe you can, uh, if you have a time pressure, you can in ignore other five. But at least one of these each four operations you should implement. Then unsafe HTTP methods and data about users in the system so it's about authentication so it's up to you how you want to uh, authenticate your users so you can choose OAuth or other mechanism but I guess uh, OAuth could be uh, interesting to learn and might not be simple to implement but it would be interesting for you to learn your API should give some uh, ability to register a uh, webhook so maybe uh, if if you if you can find if you can have a webhook which can which can trigger some events or changes and uh, it's also asking uh, to put your project on postman or you can also use uh, numenfly so that it can be possible to test uh, error handling so this is the interaction design and uh, maybe you can choose some of the rules that I mentioned uh, for uh, for handling your errors so instead of handling uh, in a general way try to be very specific uh, so you should also publish your code and uh, your solution should be testable maybe you should also provide a readme file that is another important uh, aspect for the pr uh, project or having good practice uh, maybe you can also make a script file that will automatically uh, that that will basically automate the whole process uh, take uh, from taking the data uh, making the calls and uh, getting the responses uh, for your APIs. So if you have your own idea, you can start working on the project immediately. Else there are some suggestions 
I think there is only one suggestion, so you can go with it. But what I uh, what I believe that if you just follow the slides, it will be more than enough uh, uh, to to apply most of or maybe all of the criteria that there is asking for. But uh, you obviously uh, have to know some basic on REST API development. So any questions so far from these two lectures? Uh, from the previous lecture and today? Those, uh, this, these rules are not very hard rules, but uh, it's, uh, since they are very not, not very hard, it's also um, easy to remember, uh, to forget them. So that's the thing. So if you consider those rules while you are making your APIs from the scratch, uh, your APIs should come up, obviously, in great quality. Any questions you have? No. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions uh, online, or did you get the overview of the assignment that we showed or discussed? So I don't know how many people are online. So hopefully. Okay, so okay, w I don't know when is the deadline also for the assignment. Do you do not do you know the deadline? So I guess uh, then Joan will also discuss uh, the deadline after. No, it's for this month. Okay, so you have about uh, one month. So I suggest you start or start uh, to start working immediately, so that uh, if you have any questions or any problems we can discuss. So thank you then. Luckily we finished today early.